No black person hasn't been insecure about color. You can't identify with looking in the mirror saying, am I too dark? Look like an African with them big liver lips. You can't grow up without it having some effect on you. A Question of Color. Tuesday at 10 on KCET. This is KCET 28, Los Angeles. Future Quest is made possible by AT&T, a proud supporter of public television. Have you ever had an assistant who lived in your computer? And I'm still working on those tickets. You will. And the company that will bring it to you, AT&T. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. I'm ready for my future now, Mr. DeMille. on the move for business for pleasure for survival from jet planes to the Jetsons we've dreamed up some fantastic ways to get from here to there how soon will it be before we start pricing our, our own personal transporter in the showroom of the future how long before we can actually say beam me up well gotta go species is to some degree built on travel and exploration. We started as a group of tribes in a limited area, probably in Africa, and have expanded out to cover the globe. Great expansions like the one that crossed uh, the Bering Straits. We used to be nomadic until agriculture came around and then we became terribly fearful of our possessions because we needed to defend our cows and our uh, crops and the outsiders then became a threat. And the outsiders are always the people who travel and spread ideas and germs, and they are a threat to settled people, and yet without nomadism, we wouldn't have a human society. Well, look at my family, for example, right? My, my father brought us to America from Mexico because he really did believe that the grass was greener on the other side. And it was, but it's astral turf. I think there are a lot of unexploited ideas about travel, and we're seeing a little of that already with just the variety of ways people travel, and that's to me is the, is the direction to go, is not to look for new monolithic forms, but to look for alternatives. Firebird 2 to Control Tower. We are about to take off on the highway of tomorrow. We've been reinventing the car as what we call the supercar, which is an ultralight hybrid, which means that the wheels are driven electrically, but the electricity is made on board as needed from fuel. So you don't need to haul around half a ton of batteries. That is, you get a family car that could drive you coast to coast on one tank of any convenient fuel. And I think it may amount to the biggest change in industrial structure since the microchip. The automobile is an interesting paradox. It, it contributed a terrific amount to 
what we now enjoy as quality of life. At the same time, the car is destroying much of what I love about the countryside. We just stuck a, uh, a four-lane highway halfway up this valley. Our land use is so nutty that we need to use a transportation system to go someplace else because we, we're not already where we want to be. We end up reducing our social interactions to aggressive competition for square feet of asphalt. We're giving up street life. It's, it's not a good way to live. So if you have supercars driven by eight or ten million New Yorkers or Los Angelenos or a billion still carless Chinese, you wouldn't run out of air or oil anymore. Instead, you'd run out of roads and patience. Listen, lady, I can't pick up this cab and carry it, can I? I think everybody wants everybody to quit driving so much so they can have the roads to themselves. 25 years from now, you'll probably sit in your car and tell it, I want to go to work. And the vehicle will then communicate with the roadway and interrogate uh, the roadways to find out which are the blocked roads and which are the free roads and uh, route your vehicle via the roads which are quickest to get you to your destination and you would probably read the paper and drink your coffee and when you're at work it would uh, alert you and you'd get out. The traffic signals would be more intelligent, they'd be better coordinated so that you would not have to sit there at a red light while no traffic is going on the cross street. You would get to a freeway on-ramp at which point you would punch in your destination exit from that freeway and then your car would automatically be checked out to verify its condition and then the car would transition into automatic control. And you announce your destination and you'll be assigned a path by the roadside monitor. Essentially it's uh, drivers who are made extremely polite because they're replaced by computers and in the computers you wire in all the polite etiquette for driving. Right now it's saying I want to change lane, I want to go to an automated lane. So the car in the back is acknowledging that message and they try to coordinate this change lane procedure. It's very similar, it's sort of an advanced version of cruise control. This is a type of magnet which you put on the uh, refrigerator and it's a little larger size and the magnets tell the vehicle how far you're from the center of the roadway. The roadway magnets tell the vehicle where to go and uh, you know, the curvature coming ahead and the sensor and the computer determine that how far you want to steer from the road center. Now the vehicle is uh, steering by itself. In the future, when you get into the car, you push a button and uh, the vehicle will be able to follow the road. This type of technology is something that we're going to see probably in the next year or two of that time frame. So it's the first step, and it will be one of the most visible steps that uh, intelligent vehicle and highway systems are, are going to be uh, a thing of the future, and maybe a thing of the present. Oh, forget driving. Don't we really want to fly? I think flying is strange. I don't think you should be able to go 500 miles an hour and be five miles up in the air and asking someone for a Coke. You know, I don't think that's right. People have talked ever since the aircraft was invented, which was in 1903, they've talked about the idea that you would commute to work in your own airplane. My interest in aircraft that they can take off vertically and fly uh, horizontally like the birds was when I was first introduced to about five years old to the hummingbird. Because the hummingbird is a wonderful creature in its ability to take off vertically, but it, it uh, does require a lot of energy to do that. When I was in a helicopter, I always felt I was being pulled up by a crane, vibrating noises and, and something above me pulling me. But when I rose in this vehicle here, there is no vibration whatsoever, and it's like a magic carpet. And if you didn't have some degree of noise, you truly would have the real magic car. We're a little slower than a jet plane, but of course, we're a lot quicker in both ends of the trip. And you get to see the scenery more conveniently with this kind of vehicle, even if you want to fly upside down so you can get even a better vision of it. The world in the year 2000 plus is going to be an air taxi network where 
we're going to utilize vehicles like this and they're going to go very fast 400 500 miles an hour but they're going to carry just a few people so you go when you want where you want you don't wait till you have to fill up a whole airliner you leave on schedule and you carry four people four paying people if that's what it is in a four passenger aircraft or one person I think we're so busy trying to rush some, we're trying to build a faster plane, trying to beam me up, Scotty, dematerialize here, materialize over there. I think we got it backwards. I think all the things that we need should come to us. The safest kind of driving is negatrips, not having to drive at all, because you go by some other inherently much safer means of transport, or you don't need to go because you're already there. We have a good deal of evidence now that over a decade or two, if we cluster development around transit corridors, we can make one mile of transit replace about four to eight miles of driving. Because where people live, work, shop, and so on tends to cluster, we can do more things in one trip and have fewer trips and shorter trips. If one sees commuting as largely a business activity, then to a very large extent it can be taken over by electronics. When we develop sophisticated video conferencing, um, we will be able to cut out of, uh, the necessity for a lot of actual uh, physical displacement of business personnel. And therefore I, I would not myself expect to see commuter space shuttles or commuter rockets, because I, I, I simply don't think that the payoff uh, would, would be worth the investment. So I think we, we're much more likely to see commuting uh, slowly uh, disappearing over time. Nobody wants to take monorails or public transportation because you have to sit next to other smelly people. I think that's the real reason why you don't see more public transit. One has to draw a distinction between sort of necessary functional travel, which one wants to be as fast as possible. There's a sense in which the time spent traveling is, is, is dead, and one simply wants to get from point A to point B in a minimum. And recreational travel, which, which is often deliberately slow, because one wants to take in the surroundings. So one might be able to see a future for things like dirigible airships, which can't go very quickly. Hey, what's your idea of the perfect way to travel? It's a car with a magnet under it, and on the bottom is another magnet instead of the road, so it like hovers. You don't feel any bumps on the road. It can work by solar power from the sun, and um, there's an engine, and then the solar power makes the car work. It can go real fast, up to 257 miles per hour. My ideal uh, vehicle, would be a tank, or it would be a tank that flew. This is my bus, and the driver isn't in the car. He or she is in an office controlling it by computer. I guess a car that runs on air. Yeah, something that floats, something, something out of Star Trek. Fascinating. That's travel above the Earth. How about through the Earth? One ingenious idea that's been around for years is based on simple Newtonian gravity. That is that if you build a, a tunnel uh, that is at its center uh, perpendicular to the center of the Earth so that uh, it goes absolutely straight from any two points on the surface of the globe, you can use gravity to accelerate your train, let's say, for the first half of that trip. And the second half, it'll just cruise and it'll almost reach the end. You just need just a little additional power to get it to the end. Well, here's England. Here's America, a tunnel, like that. The intriguing thing about this system is that it takes the same amount of time to make any trip of any distance, because the longer the tunnel, the further it falls and accelerates faster. So if you had a system of tunnels, like if you're in Chicago and you had tunnels going, say, to Los Angeles and New Orleans, Miami and New York, uh, no matter what your destination, you always arrive the same amount of time after you, you set out. I'm not going in that tunnel under the English Channel. That's insane. It's insane now. In 20 years, it'll be normal. And what's the difference between now and 20 years? 20 years have gone by. 
this is a teleporter. When you go in and it breaks you up into just regular atoms and it zooms you through this tube to the next, to the place you want to go. It would be uh, just like in Star Trek where you just beam places. Stand by to beam up landing party. Wouldn't that be great? They could just say, I'm, I want to be there and zoop, you're there. Enterprise. Transport room energized. Except you probably have to wait in line, you know, with other people waiting to be beamed. And uh, people would complain, like, hey, hey, buddy, want to lose a little weight? You're taking 10 seconds to get beamed there. I got to go. I would travel by beam if I could have a window. I'm not sure, but I think we've been insulted. I'm sure. Are we forgetting space travel? Space Patrol! We're in space travel about where aviation was in 1910. The basic difficulty with getting into space, getting off the rock, getting off planet Earth, is that we're down at the bottom of a gravity well, and we have to climb out of that well to get anywhere. And the well is basically five miles a second deep. That is, you have to get up to a speed of about five miles a second to get into Earth orbit. In 20 years, aviation went to the DC-3, and the DC-3 essentially made air transportation available to anybody who really wanted it. The same is true with space. We have to develop reliable and cheap means of access to Earth orbit so that the cost of your going to Earth orbit is in the order of the cost of your buying a ticket from Los Angeles to Sydney, Australia. There's one lovely suggestion that has just come along, which is to build something that is a rocket-powered airplane that takes off from the ground almost empty and then refuels from an Air Force tanker just the way Air Force fighter planes do. And because it can be much lighter when it takes off, since it's almost empty, it can get enough performance by refueling that way to get the rest of the way to orbit. Now, there are lots of other ways to get into space, to get off the rock. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. You can do away with the whole idea of rockets and build what's generically known as a cannon launcher, something that really is just a very big gun. These projectiles would make the mother of all sonic booms as they come out. Anybody in their immediate neighborhood would definitely need earplugs. There is another idea, and it is in some sense the simplest possible way to get to space. You build an elevator. And the space elevator, at its simplest description, is a long cable that starts from the surface of the Earth and goes far out into space, 40,000 miles or more. And it is used just like the cable of an elevator. You could actually just climb up that string all the way to geosynchronous orbit. Now, there are some details. One is, for instance, that you have to have a corresponding amount of string or at least some kind of a counterweight on the other side of geosynchronous orbit that's actually being thrown away from the Earth as it orbits around to balance the weight of the string. But that's a minor problem. You capture a small asteroid and hang it in the appropriate orbit. The big problem is that we don't have any string that's strong enough. But 100 years from now, we should have materials stronger than we have today, much stronger. At that point, the space elevator becomes a very attractive alternative to rockets. It would really look like this end, whatever it is, an elevator car, just slowly dropping out of the sky, stopping in front of you, the doors open, you get on, and then it would slowly pick up and go away again. Once you get to low Earth orbit, once you're off the rock, Robert Heinlein's quote was, you're halfway to anywhere. And it's basically true. You've gotten half of the energy you need to go to anywhere in the solar system. Getting the other half, you can do a wide variety of different ways. There are two ways to send people to the stars, real fast or real slow. If you go real slow, 
you can send them in a sort of a hollowed out asteroid or a large space colony that's already been thoroughly rehearsed in our solar system somewhere. People are used to living in it. And all you do is give a little nudge out of the solar system and you're traveling real slow to the nearest star wherever you want to go. How fast could we go? The nearest star is what? Four light years away, which means if you travel at the speed of light, it takes you four years. You have to invent a propulsion system that can take you at some reasonable fraction of the speed of light uh, out of the solar system. And that requires control of energies that we just don't have yet. We can't travel at the speed of light. We can't can travel at a tiny little percentage that's probably about equivalent to the space in between my two fingers there. There are problems with just uh, the interstellar medium. Trying to travel very fast through it can be a big problem. There are navigation problems, but those will eventually be solved. Uh, I think the human factors problems, even on a fast mission, uh, shouldn't be underestimated. Presumably, it's going to be a long trip, even if it's so-called fast or slow. And so if you're going to be spending a huge fraction of your life, regardless of how you do it in interstellar space, is it worth it to come back? What we have to have for interstellar flight, we haven't invented yet, so I can't, I can't say for sure, but we are certainly working on new propulsion systems on the use of nuclear energy, on the use of laser and solar propulsion, maybe even one dreams of matter and antimatter rockets. You can collect antiprotons a few at a time now in a magnetic trap and collect them and mix anti-electrons into them and make anti-hydrogen atoms and cool those down and freeze them into anti-hydrogen ice and somehow store them in a magnetic bottle. And if you take just a pinch of anti-hydrogen and mix it with ordinary matter, the ordinary matter and the antimatter cancel each other out and release the entire energy that's there in the mass. It's a perfect conversion of matter to energy. You can revolutionize transportation, all right. Yes. Have you constructed a working model? There's all these scenarios and a lot of dreaming and scheming about doing it, and, and nobody's built these things. Scotty, can you do it? Not by myself. I'll need help. I'm a doctor, not an engineer. Uh, I think it's uh, one of Arthur C. Clarke's rules that if an elderly scientist says it's impossible, it will be done. So never say impossible. The fun about solar sailing is, is everybody thinks they understand it until you tell them the first thing and they say, oh, I guess it wasn't what I thought I understood. Solar wind is made up of electrons that stream out of the sun and they're about three orders of magnitude less powerful than the sunlight itself. The sunlight pressure, when it hits a, a mirror or something very highly reflective, pushes that mirror because it bounces off of it. And the, that push is the force that makes the uh, solar sail have energy and be able to propel a vehicle. And a two mile square sail uh, could probably carry a human mission to Mars. Uh, so it is pretty exciting. Uh, to all the sailors, uh, I like to sail myself, the idea of uh, being in a uh, spaceship and tacking and uh, jibing our way across the uh, solar system. There are certainly uh, technical impediments to uh, human exploration uh, beyond uh, Earth orbit, but these are all challenges. In point of fact, I'm not sure that they're any greater than the challenges of uh, explorers who had to go to the uh, South Pole uh, or the Antarctic uh, or even who had to trek across the continent in covered wagons over periods of similar time uh, frame and uh, very harsh conditions. Uh, I think these are things that I would confidently predict we will overcome. We have a stake in exploration because a lot of rewards have been brought to our species by people who are bold enough to go out to the Magellans of each tribe and search out uh, unknown places and, uh, and discount the brave trails of, uh, of the dangers that they've faced and bring back that most valuable thing, information and experience about different environments. That's all of a single thread. The first young person to go on a walkabout from a tribe in Africa began an exploration it goes right up through the Apollo missions to the moon. One does the idea of exploring, of reaching beyond their limits, both technically and scientifically in the pursuit of knowledge, 
not because they think their future will be bad or because it's, it's, uh, they think there won't be a future, but because they think they're going to create something new in the future, something better. So I think that's the exciting question right now is where, where will the human be in future exploration? Imagine taking a solar sailboat on a voyage to Mars. Imagine commuting from galaxy to galaxy through a wormhole in the fabric of space and time. The combination of high-tech transport and basic human wanderlust should make for fascinating traveling companions in the future. And the future is where we will spend the rest of our lives. Now stay with us as another episode of Future Quest looks at computers. It's next. Quest is made possible by AT&T, a proud supporter of public television. Have you ever sent someone a fax? From the beach? You will. And the company that will bring it to you? AT&T. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is PBS.